who are Hazaras, you know, where they came from, you know, why we've been persecuted, uh, who are my ancestors. If there is one stick, so everybody can break it off very easily. And if there is ten sticks, nobody can break it off, you know. There's a power struggle between Russia and China. It's always yeah. it's always been this way uh, for centuries, yeah. you know. They, in effect, they wanted to remove the remnant of uh, Mongolian civilization. They wanted to remove anything that connecting Afghanistan with Mongolia. Hello, how are you? And uh, could you please uh, introduce yourself uh, briefly? Okay, first of all, uh, my name is John Gulzari. So I am in Hazara from uh, central region of Afghanistan. There is a state called Ghazni. Uh, in that state, Ghazni, which is in central region of Afghanistan, I born there, my parents born there, my ancestors born there. So we are Hazaras from central Afghanistan. Uh, past 20 years I've been living um, uh, in Australia, and um, I'm also uh, researching on Hazara's history. So I've, uh, I'm co-founder of uh, uh, a group called Hazarology, which is a research-based platform. I'm also uh, a president of local organization here by the name of Mechit, which is a music, arts, and culture of Hazara identity in Daino, which is a local suburb here. And I got a master's degree in entrepreneurship and innovation and I'm still learning and improving myself. So, uh, my uh, second question is, uh, how much uh, do you know about the history of Mongolia and what aspect of uh, Mongolian history do you take the interest the most? Uh, first thing is that uh, we know the Mongolian history is starting from the Great Khan, Genghis Khan, which uh, 12th and half century or 13th century, uh, his excursion to uh, Afghanistan, uh, Central Asia, and all those regions. I also know that, um, I, you know, uh, the world population, I don't know, I just don't quote me on this figure, maybe above 25 percent or maybe, I don't know, three in ten or something like that, or one in seven people share the DNA of uh, Great Khan or maybe Mongolian people. And uh, later on I'll tell you about my DNA as well and also the ancestry that I share. Uh, and also I know about Mongolian that they are brave people, they are good marksmen, they are legendary horse riders, they are, uh, Mongolia is a vast land between Russia and China, and it is huge uh, land. Mongo um, large majority of people live, uh, people of Mongolia live nomadic life, and um, I really love the throat music which is, which is produced in Mongolia. And um, once I uh, know there is a Nada festival or something that about Mongolian racing and about Mongolian culture, tradition and show and so on. Uh, what yeah. about the current uh, state of Mongolia? Uh, how much do you know about the current uh, state of Mongolia? Uh, sure. the, the country I live in, the capital sure. Ulaanbaatar is right, uh, yeah, right sure. now I'm here. I know that, yeah, I know that the government is uh, separated from the Russian or uh, uh, come out of being influenced between Russia and their independent nation. Uh, so I talked about religion. Uh, people, as I said, Olan Butter is quite well established. It's like towards 21st century city. And many of the people go to US to study. And I believe current or past Prime Minister also went in US to study and brought the knowledge back home and try to improve the uh, living standard, economic standard, finance standards of Mongolia. Uh, current political state of play, so I know Mongolia is sort of sandwiched between two uh, superpowers such as Russia and China, so let's see how well Mongolia will do. Mm -hmm. uh, and also future trajectory where is the once Mongolia was glorious and also, you know, the prestigious and also highly influential. Uh, will, will Mongolia, will she get uh, to position of being a sort of brand makers, being in a position of 
having a sovereignty, has being in a position of playing uh, international role among the Asian countries, such as ASEAN or maybe uh, South Asian countries or China, Pakistan, India, and those regions. Uh, so these are my future ambitions and desires to know more about Mongolia. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me because this is no. not an official interview. So I want to mm -hmm. make it an informal way. So fantastic. Okay. Uh, we can make a two-way conversation. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I'd be happy to know more about the economy. That how the economy is doing at the moment, and you know what uh, what we see in the future. Do you know? I believe. In. Mongolia, half of the population are nomadic herders. So half of the population, yep. Yeah, agricultural agriculture and nomadic pastoralism is a main mm. part of the economy. And uh, oh. last ten years, the mining yep. has sector has been booming. Mm, great. Uh, there are two big mines, Oyu uh, Tozga and Town Tozga. One is coal and one is copper mine and. Uh, that's the big part of the economy and the export. Mm, yeah. So it's been doing really good, but there is a lot of uh, controversy surrounding it. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, also, we are exporting big exporter of the cashmere to China. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's also one of the uh, main part of the economy. But uh, we are totally dependent on our two neighbors because we are uh, neighbors just two countries, Russia and China. Mm. So our economy yeah. is uh, uh, fully dependent on Russia and China. Yeah, I just see in the media, sorry to interrupt, I just saw in the media that you know, many people thinking that China is exerting a lot of influence on Mongolia uh, and many people are not happy about it, is it correct? Yes, especially with the Belt and Road Initiative. They have been uh, taking a lot of initiatives to increase their influence mm, over uh, yeah. our country, and uh, there's a power struggle between Russia and China. It's yeah, always it's always been this way uh, for centuries, yeah. you know. Yeah, I understand. Yep. One of trying to gain power, and uh, yeah. but uh, I think the Chinese influence is growing, especially with their uh, economies growing, and uh, also there are big projects like Ro uh, Belt and Road, and uh, also other projects. Yeah, I'm quite aware about uh, the new Silk Road, uh, which is initiated by China, and how influence that's going to happen around the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that you know China's economy surpassed U.S. economy some five years ago, or even longer. I am quite aware of that as well. And I know currently the role that China play in Asian countries as well as uh, Europe, uh, Western countries around Australia, America, and also in South. China Sea and so on, you know, I'm quite aware of that uh, landscape. Uh, so how do you see the future trajectory of uh, Mongolia? Will you think that one day they will, they will achieve the glorious status that they used to have or maybe I think half of that status or maybe at least to be a southern nation and living in quite well above the poverty line and uh, also to live quite uh, sort of, uh, not dominantly I should say, but to living like you know shoulder by shoulder with the other nations in Asia like there's my nation countries sure yep. yeah I'm hoping that we could uh, develop our relationship with uh, other countries not just Russia and China uh, yep. maybe Western countries and um, yep. I am I'm hoping that we could develop our industrial sector so that we yep. can come uh, uh, produce our product not just uh, sure. uh, import from the other countries that's uh, what I hope in the future. Mm, that's but, great. Mm -hmm. Also, we are also, uh, our government was uh, developing this big project to uh, boost the tourism industry because mm. we have a lot of uh, natural, uh, beautiful places and other histor yeah. historical places. But because of the pandemic, that project yeah. was uh, postponed and it's hitting our economy also really hard. And this mm. lockdowns restrictions is uh, sure. really affecting the small and the medium businesses. Sure. Mm -hmm. I, oh, that's I, great. Mm -hmm. My que next question is about the connection between Hazara and Mongolian people. Some people say that the Hazara means a thousand in Persian language, 
and because uh, that means Myungat in Mongolian and it, it's a uh, uh, military unit in the Genghis Khan time and also other guy told me that uh, Hazara means uh, uh, descendant of Hasar, the brother of uh, Genghis Khan so I'm kind of confused uh, by this uh, origin story so could you clarify this uh, stories? <laughs> Well, some people believe Hazaras derive from words, from Persian words called Hazar, which means 1,000. Uh, I disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, some other people think that, you know, Hazaras from uh, Mongolian uh, garrison of thousands, like thousands, hundreds, and tens. This, I think, has some resemblance because, well, Hazara says thousand, well, they are sort of, uh, it's because they share the background from with Mongolia and ancestry and so on. So it could be somehow legitimate, some, somehow acceptable. Among the Hazaras there is, uh, uh, they call Daya, Da. Dai Pauladi, Dai Mirda, Dai Zingi, Dai Kundi, Dai Dinya, Dai Choban, uh, Dai Besu, Dai Merda, and so on. There's 10 Dai. Dai means 10, as you have in the Mongolian army in uh, like tens, soldier of uh, battalion of tens, mm -hmm. and battalions of hundreds, mm -hmm. and battalion of thousands. Mm -hmm. So they could legitimately be uh, that, that those tens are daya, are, are da, da means ten. Yeah. So this ten could be derived from that origin. Some years ago there was also research done by one of the scholars uh, who has written around I think 30, 40 books in Afghanistan. His name is uh, his name is uh, Abdul Hai Habibi, and he used to be one of the uh, ministers for the higher education and for research in Afghanistan. Uh, he has written one article. It says that is the Hazara an ancient word. Uh, based on his explanation, he says Hazara is an ancient word. However, he's trying to uh, bring the Hazara under his language that is derived from Pashto which means, Hazara means Pachal, which means happy people. And I try to steer the words Hazara towards Pashto. Mm -hmm. And as I said, you know, some Western scholars, they try to drive Hazaras uh, towards Persian. Uh, because I think, and uh, it says some say Pashto, some say Persian, and some of the Oriental scholars like uh, uh, Temur Khanov, he was a Russian uh, scholar, sociologist, and he has written a book on the history of Hazaras in 19th century or late 18th century. Uh, so his book is quite uh, credible, is very authentic, is very research-based, and he had ex excellent knowledge about Hazaras and the uh, situation of Hazaras. And highly recommend others to read as well. It is translated in Persian, it's also translated in Urdu language. I'm sure it may have been translated in English as well, but I haven't seen that. So yeah, uh, there is a fifth century um, uh, Chinese monks by name of Hu and Tsong. When in the fifth century, Hu and Tsong is quite famous among all the scholars and historians of Afghanistan. So he's made a journey between, uh, he was one of those missionaries, Buddhist monk missionaries, who went on foot from China in you know, order to Silk Road and Bamiyan, uh, which is Hazara, uh, Hazara land. From there he went to India, and then on the trip he come back from that land, Central Asian uh, route to uh, China. Mm -hmm. So in this he explained that uh, when he went to Bamiyan, which is, uh, uh, which is the capital of Hazaristan, Hazarajat, uh, he saw the Buddhas and there was uh, two st statues of giant Buddhas, and there was that one as well. And also, there was a lot of caves where the monks sit and pray and, and meditate. Uh, and he mentioned the words Ozala and Hozala, which is which is similar people now, uh, 1,500 years ago, years now. Mm -hmm. The Hazaras, they still occupy that land. And uh, he mentioned that Ozala or Hozala. I believe that later on this one changed into Hazara. Hozala, Hazara. 
Ozala Hazara. But I'm on the Hazaras, people call themselves Azra, A Z R A. And uh, there is a movie also made in Persian language they call the uh, Adgari Sarzamini Azar, which means a uh, movie, a documentary about the Azar land. So, what Azar means is that uh, Azar is referred to Hazaras because Hazaras is the Mulki Azramorum, as Mulki Azramayum, which means I am going to Hazara land and I am coming from Hazara land. Azar. A Z A R. Mm -hmm. So this is the brief explanation about the words Hazara. Mm -hmm. But still, but still, I'd like to interject here a note that uh, some Western countries which they had interest in Afghanistan, a pol uh, you know, there's a saying in English they call only victors write the history. And I know that's true because people uh, during time of uh, British invasion, during time of the East India Company. Uh, during time of where the Hazara subjugated in 1880 to 1891, um, uh, they have written the history and they try to mislead people. So the Hazaras doesn't know about their origins, the Hazaras doesn't know about their culture, and the Hazaras doesn't know about their language. Because Western people, Western scholars, they scapegoat Hazaras to be the variant and remnant of Persian, which is not true. Hazaras, mind you, share only 2% of DNA with, 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 with Persia. Mm -hmm. I'd like to give you a com combination, composition of the uh, DNA of Hazaras. Mm -hmm. uh, based on my DNA, mm -hmm. my parents both from central region of Afghanistan and my ancestors from central region of Afghanistan. This is the first time, by the way, that I'm sharing my DNA information. I haven't shared it before. Mm -hmm. uh, so your viewers are privileged that, uh, <laughs> that they can see the first hand information, first hand knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, here, this is ninety-three percent. I don't know whether you can see it. Yes. Uh, yep. Asia Central. Yep. So ninety-three percent of people from Central Asia, and six percent from East Asia. Mm. Mm hmm. Six percent. And one percent from, let's say, India or South Asia. South Asia. Asia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is my DNA. Okay. Here you can see more in, in the details that you see only like maximum 4% because it was the first research. Yeah. But now they show me 2% of my DNA uh -huh. is shared with the modern day Iran or Persia, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So large majority you can see on the top, they share Central Asia. Uh, North. Okay. Central Asia, uh, North Asia. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Many of those those regions, you see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I mean by that is that Hazar has been uh, sort of in default been been put with the Persian, which is not correct, which is not true. Mm -hmm. uh, Hazaragi language, for example, is a good example uh, because initially, when there was in eighteen eighteen ninety or something like that, eighteen hundred, when they were they done the language dissection. They put Hazaras as a Persian language, which is not true. Uh, yeah, it's, I agree that you know Hazaras, uh, Hazaragi, Persian, Urdu, uh, some other languages like Pashto and the other things, they share common alphabet, which is Arabic. But they have different ancestries because, okay, if the uh, over 90% of Hazaras share the DNA from uh, with Mongolia and Central Asia, how they can be a Persian? Uh, because the Persian are uh, Indo-European race, and their language is Indo-European, which is not correct. Mm -hmm. That if the Mong uh, predominantly Mongolian and Central Asian background uh, is put together with Indo-European, which doesn't make sense. So yeah, that's what I wanted to share. Mm -hmm. I was uh, very surprised to find out that some Hazara words were similar to Mongolian words. There's camber and especially connected to foods, food and cuisine. There's a lot of uh, similar words. And At the same time, busrav, mm -hmm. dambura, something like that. Oh. Mm, yes. Uh, so I think uh, uh, there's a research needs to be done. There's a to to uh, find the connection between Hazara Mongolian language. And uh, my next question is. 
what is the general attitude of Hazara people towards Mongolia? And uh, for example, if I visit a random Hazara family right now, and how would they react? And how would they welcome me? What would it okay. be their reaction? I yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Sure, that's very interesting. Thank you for asking that. Uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, I think my words remain there. I just would like to say two points in the previous question, then I go to the next question. Uh, and the his history, you know, and the origin of Hazara has been shrouded in mysteries. It's been diluted, you know, maybe intentionally or unintentionally. So, the Hazara doesn't know what their roots are, where they came from, who are their ancestors, and it is also because of political gain. You know, in Hazara Gibi, he says, Aura Gatolku Mahi Bigar. He says, dilute the water and catch fish. You know? Mm. But this is similar story there because when the Hazara doesn't know about their ancestors, doesn't know about their religion, doesn't know about their past, doesn't know about their history, doesn't know anything about their language and so on, they will accept whatever the people put forth, you know? So I wanted to say that. Okay. So now he says that uh, attitude of Hazaras towards uh, Mongolia, Mongolian people, you know. Uh, so yeah, I'd like to explain that Hazaras are very hospitable people. Uh, they also honor their guests, the same like Mongolians do. Because when you go in Mongolia, if you live in one of those gur or maybe they, those those uh, tent, round tent, mm. uh, people will offer you food. They will also maybe share with you, you know, the, uh, the perfume that they have. You know, they will tell you to smell and things like that. And they give you some gift or souvenir, you know, to take away with you. And I believe Mongolians are very generous people. Uh, I think similar habit you can observe within, uh, within Hazaras. Haz Hazaras are very hospitable. They also honor their guests because when the guest is no, can known or considered as blessing, because there is a saying in Hazara says, when the guests come, they will bring their food with them. So it means that you don't have to worry that you cannot feed your guest, you know. And the other thing is that non piyas kashwas, whatever you have, you just share it with your guest, you know. Past 10 years I've been researching on cultural elements of Hazaras, for example, Hazara embroidery, Hazara handicraft, Hazara tools, Hazara uh, artworks, Hazaras, uh, sort of the remnant of the Hazara <coughs> handicrafts. And this we found, you know, that Hazaras have special tools for washing people's hand. Hmm. And this is because in Afghanistan, they don't have a kind of pipe or water, something that's coming from the pipe. So people go fill it from river, from, from, uh, from spring, and they bring it at home. And when the guests come, they wash their hand. And when we, whenever we do the cultural and embroidery show and handicraft show, we will display that as well. And this is a sign of Hazara hospitality. And also in the past, there was a lady journalist. I may have her name here. Uh, but I can give it to you later on after the interview. Uh, she uh, wanted to find out in late 1990s, I think, or uh, maybe around 95 or something like that, you know. Uh, so she went from Mongolia to Koita, Pakistan. And from there, she was taken to uh, uh, to capital of Hazarajat, Afghanistan, where the Buddhas are. And she, uh, she received, uh, she talked with a lot of people. She received a lot of good hospitality. Um, and she also um, uh, done a research on the, and there was another another team that came and you know, was doing research about DNA Hazaras. And I believe they've gathered, collected 100 samples from Hazaras living in Quetta, Pakistan and Hazaras living in uh, uh, Hazarajat, central region of Afghanistan. Um, and those two people that there for the past 10 years, they've been friend of mine and they've been uh, we've been very interesting to their activities and they've been very interested in following me very closely. And uh, and also we have friends in USA, his name is Engineer Gazabi, who I believe visited several times Mongolia and he also he is also one of the uh, high ranking person in Afghanistan parliament. He is also an engineer, he's living in the USA. Uh, so he visited uh, Ulaanbaatar several times with uh, Munkabaya and some other people and gifted as a um, uh, the Hazara's book which is quite famous and also authentic book which is written by Hazara scholar from USA 
as I mentioned, that Hazara students currently on a scholarship in uh, Mongolia. There's 30 or 50 of them, or even more. And they had a form very good friendship with, with Mongolian people, with their uh, brother and sisters. And um, and also, I believe that uh, Nili Daikundi, which is one of the region in Hazarajat, has been known as sister city uh, with Ulaanbaatar. Uh, Hazara would welcome Mongolian brother and sister with open arm, mm-hmm. uh, as we believe that we share common ancestry. And, um, um, we are connected by blood rather than, you know, by by having general hospitality, I should say, you know. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, my next question is, how could uh, we, the ordinary people, uh, help ensure the cultural and uh, political solidarity of Hazaras and Mongolians? And to your knowledge, what are the international and uh, national organizations that help advocate this uh, ideal? The general people, uh, curiosity is a big thing. And I'm always very curious and fascinated about the other culture, history, religion, faith, you know, the way of people living, you know, anthropology, you know, and uh, to know about people's norms, traditions, all those things. So I believe, maybe I think our Mongolian brothers, sisters, the viewers who is viewing this uh, program, they may be able to find out more about the Hazaras. Um, they may research about Hazaras. I know a friend who is also, his name is, English name is Mike, he's living in New York City. He's currently uh, gathering all the books on Hazara culture, Hazaras, and also he's writing uh, a book on Hazara. He's Mongolian living in the USA. I mean, if the person who has such a dedication that he gathers all the uh, knowledge and writes about a nation, which is a big commitment, and I know our good friend, uh, Mr. Munkabaya uh, from Poland Bator, he has been dedicated to Hazara cause, especially when there is Hazara genocide, he has stood up with us. We are so indebted to Mongolian people, we are indebted to Poland Bator, we are indebted to Munkabaya, and also other friends who is accompanying Munkabaya because uh, Hazaras at the moment uh, uh, currently being persecuted and I believe it's your next question, so I'll leave it to the next question. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so yeah, yeah, we have mutual friends in USA, uh, Hazara friends, who each year, well, there's a scholar, a friend of mine, who is co-founder of Hazarology as well, Mr. Isaac Muhammadi, he's in USA, and each year at the University of the Great Khan, Ganges Khan, when he go there, he give a, a research. He research and give a lecture on the on the some of his experience, tactics, knowledge. You know the way of the way of ruling, the way of you know uh, how great guy he was and and what he done. You know what the legacy he left behind. You know. And also, I believe there is a group in Sydney as well, Sydney, Australia. A friend of mine visited some five five seven years ago, Mongolia. And they, they also go together with the Mongolian Association here in Sydney. And each year they celebrate uh, the anniversary of independence of Mongolia, also celebrating the Great Khan's birth anniversary. I also tried here in Melbourne, Victoria, in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, there is a, a couple of people from Mongolia and they have an association here. I've tried to get a connection with them and form this French mutual friendship so we could, you know, collaborate, uh, sort of share the ideas, knowledge, and those things. As you said in my pre- previous question, that how comes the Hazaras have a lot of words from Mongolia? Uh, for your information and for information of viewers, there's 20%, almost 20%, according to some book, uh, 20% of Hazaragi language is Mongolian, and uh, around 10 to 20% of Hazaragi language is Turkish. And now you would be surprised why Turkish. Now mm-hmm. would be surprised why Mongolia. Mm-hmm. Because I believe, and also history also says that you know, I've written, read tens of dozens of books. You know, most of them says that uh, uh, Turkey, Turkish, and Mongolian are from uh, share similar ancestry. Uh, and Hazaras, according to a couple of researchers, authentic researchers. They says Hazaras are Turco-Mongol by their origin. 
So what that means, Hazaras are Turko Mongols. So of course, you can find similarities between Hazargi words and Turkish words, Hazargi words and Mongolian words. I've read, a, I've watched a movie in Turkey, Turkish language, and I've uh, identified 300 words from that movie, which share similar words to Hazargi. I can send it to you if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I'm saying is that Hazaras of uh, share the uh, mutual ancestry with uh, Turko Mongol, or Turkish and Mongolia. Uh, that's why you find a similar words uh, in Hazaragi language. And also, last but not least, uh, there is an organization called T N N H M Tanzim Minasi Now Hazara Mogul. This is an institution in Quetta, Pakistan, which is there for past 60 years, 70 years. So they had a very good connection with uh, Mongolian researchers, Mongolian uh, news reporters. Many of them who they came to Pakistan, I believe they have visited this organization and they had a good uh, relationship in terms of exchanging ideas, knowledge and also uh, wisdom on the history of Hazaras and mutual history. You know. My uh, next question is, as you mentioned, it's about uh, oppression and persecution of Hazara people in Afghanistan yes. and Pakistan. And yep. uh, most of the Mongolians uh, don't really know much about it. It's just, uh, yep. it's just uh, the information they see on the news and briefly mentioned by the TV news and not really deep knowledge about it. And could you tell yep. us uh, more about this uh, issue? Yeah, sure. Thanks so much for uh, uh, having this empathetic question, you know. Well, the Hazara persecution started from 1890 in Afghanistan, where there was a brutal king, his name was Abdul Rahman. He set to throne in 1880, and he was he came out of the throne in 1901 when he when he was dead. So he started, you know, the elements of religion, religious segregation, racial segregation, as well as as you know ethnicity segregation. Because this is the Hazaras, they are uh, they are Chuchai Changes. That means that they are the offspring of Genghis Khan. So that's why you can murder them. You can take their wives, you can take their possessions, uh, you can take all their belongings. And there are intellectuals taken in Kabul and there were many of them were murdered. So 62% history says uh, before, 18, before 19th century, there was 63% of the population of Afghanistan was Hazaras. But now we can see this is 10 to 15% of population in Afghanistan. So yeah, in uh, uh, 1890, between to 1890 and 1900, 62% of Hazaras either genocide or persecuted or murdered or uh, also sold as slavery. 10,000 Hazara women sold as slave to India, as recorded by a um, Melbourne newspaper called the Argos newspaper. Uh, there is also uh, Hazara subjugation. There is a book written by one of the scholars. The uh, the subjugation of Hazaras in the hands of Amir Abraham Khan. Uh, so yeah, he uh, he killed most of the intellectuals, most of the scholars, burned all the historical books about Hazaras, about the Hazara culture and history and and religion and language, and um, uh, murdered the men, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, taken their wives as putting in the in in royal palace and also sold in uh, in ten thousands in Central Asia as well as sold in India uh, to sort of and many of them was given many of the Hazara women was given to the soldiers the soldiers and also um, so this is the persecution when it started and it starts continued until 1920 and one of his son they says you know the Hazara slavery is no longer acceptable so he's removed the slavery of Hazaras so Hazaras men, there was uh, from 1920 up onwards, most Hazaras working as slaves in Afghanistan up until 1978 when the Russians took over. Uh, and Hazaras doing all the menial work, they were always called as a uh, slave, they were always called as, you know, dirty, they were called, you know, the people who is janitor, people who is doing the menial work and they were uh, mistreated and they were killed in the name of their religion and the name of their race because they share share different race, which is not normal in Afghanistan because most of the races in Afghanistan share uh, Indo-European uh, race or Aryan race. And the Hazaras, because they share uh, 
Central Asian and Mongolian and also uh, 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 Northern Asian race, you know, that's why they were, they were killed, you know. And their religion, because they shared Shia sect of Islam, because when in the 6th or 7th century, when, they, when the Islamic Caliphate uh, came to Afghanistan, Hazaras adopted Shia sect of Islam. And this has been the, uh, the elements of persecution for Hazaras, their race, because they are, they are identified from, you know, 100 miles away, you know, and they are taking their identity, checking their identity card and they are killed in Pakistan. Uh, and also because of religion, because Afghanistan and Pakistan predominantly like 60-70% of Sunni race, Sunni, uh, ethnic, uh, Sunni, Sunni religion, which is Islamic sect, and, but Hazar has always been a minority, that's why they have been persecuted. And, and you know, around 3,000 people has been killed in Quetta, Pakistan in the past two decades. And there's like, you know, four or 5,000 people have been disabled, either they're injured or shrapnel of bombs and so on, you know. Uh, damage them permanently or temporarily disable them. Uh, in Afghanistan, there was thousands of people being killed in uh, uh, West Kabul. There's 4,000 people were killed in Mazar, and there was 10,000 people killed in one of the other regions. Most of this killing have been documented by Human Rights Watch. So if you go to their website, Human Rights Watch, you'll be able to see all those killings. And some of them have been well documented because I know there's a couple of scholars here from Australia, they went uh, and also done the research and they interview the people. And post-1994 when Taliban took over and there were Sunni extremists which from the other sect of Islam, they start again the genocide of Hazaras and they killed thousands, hundred thousands, even more, you know, based on a couple of the historical records and also research papers which have been released. Uh, so it's again because Hazaras, because of their ethnicity, because they look different, they look Chinese type, and Mongolian type, and also they follow the Shia sect of Islam. There's only been the elements of persecution, and it's continuing to this day. Mm -hmm. yep. How is the situation uh, right now? Right now it's quite worse because the uh, Afghanistan government, they, they try to, uh, uh, the old dog and old trick, you know, they, uh, still doing the old trick because like like his ancestors, you know, is trying to um, uh, persecute Hazaras. So recently they've they've taken 10, 20 tanks and also a couple of hundred troops and went to one of those uh, Hazara Jat region, they call it Basut, and they try to apprehend uh, some of the uh, commanders which they are protecting Hazaras because they says, why did you stand against the government? It's not your job to protect your people. It's government jobs to protect the people. But when the Taliban try to oppress Hazaras, and they have been done for past year, there's like five or seven times it happened that they, they stormed Hazara facilities and they killed, murdered a lot of people and took all their possessions. Even my region in central region in Ghazni province, a lot of people have been killed, uh, their houses been burned, uh, and the government is doing nothing because we look different and we don't share the same ancestry, and we don't share the same religion. Uh, the situation is quite worse. In Pakistan, it's been a bit, a bit eased, but for the past two decades, we know there's thousands of people, 1, 000, over 1,000 people have been killed, and over 3,000 people have been injured. So this is well documented. Most of the Hazara people live in Afghanistan and Pakistan. So what, what is the biggest difference between uh, Hazaras in Pakistan and Hazaras in Afghanistan? Okay, uh, originally Hazara is from Afghanistan, so there's a large majority there. Um, second majority is in Iran, which is like above, above 3 million. Uh, third, third majority is Hazara in Pakistan, which is around 1 million, uh, over 1 million. And the rest of the Hazara has been like around 1 million being uh, uh, sort of distributed in European countries, Australia, America, European countries. Um, well, originally Hazaras, same people, uh, they're not very different because they have 10, ten tribes, as I can say, Daya, mm -hmm. the groups of tens. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the origin was that, but uh, and they are share quite similarities in, in every terms. The only difference is maybe the language because in Afghanistan, people brought up under the Persian language and in Pakistan, people brought up under Urdu language and Iran people are brought up under Persian language again. Hmm. But in Afghanistan, there is also a Pashto language, which is one of the official language. 
so Hazaras, in terms of their language, they've been influenced. In terms of their religion, they've been influenced by, let's say, Persia, modern day Iran, because they follow the Shia sect of Islam. Mm -hmm. However, this whole region has been influenced by uh, Saudi Arabia, which they try to dominate, dominate these regions. And I believe from one side, the Iran is running proxy and the other side is uh, Saudi Arabia is running proxy and Hazara has been sandwiched in between like this, you know. Mm -hmm. So we have a saying also in Hazara Gide says, Jangi Boga, Bambali Bota. He said when two oxen or two bulls fighting with each other, you know, the grass under their legs, you know, is the one who suffers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Hazara has been, you know, the victims of, of these two religions, these two powers. Mm -hmm. And Hazara has been the victims of, of because people play game on Hazara, so Hazara has been victimized in terms of politics. Because initially there was British, then there was Russians, then there was uh, neighboring countries such as Iran, the Pakistan, you know. So all along, you know, for the past two centuries, Hazara has been uh, played upon, you know. Hazara has been, been taken for a ride, I should say. Because Hazaras were not southern enough. They were not strong enough because all their weapons were taken. Uh, they were persecuted. Their intellectuals were taken out. They were also mentally, they were tortured. They have post-traumatic stress disorder. They have, they lost their origins. They lost their ancestry. They lost their language. They lost their culture. So nothing is left. So we are just trying to build up, you know, these jigsaw puzzles, you know, putting them together. And it's very hard and it requires time, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that, those were the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, my next question is, uh, for people who are interested in knowing more about Hazara, what are the books and the movies would you recommend to them? Yep, as I mentioned to you uh, previously that, you know, only victors write the history. So when the Western write the history, they have the political agenda. When Easterns write the history of such as Iran, Persia, and those countries, they also have political agenda because they wanted to occupy. When Russians try to write the history, they also have political agenda. So the best way to find the history is from the scholars who are maybe uh, sympathetic, or from the scholars who are, have shared the ancestry themselves. So the first book comes in mind is the Kol uh, B. Hazaras, which is by a guy named of Hazara intellectual from USA. His name is Hassan Polari. Uh, he published this book in 1989 and he passed away. Unfortunately, his book is out of print and his family doesn't allow people to reprint it. Uh, the Hazaras, still you can find it here and there. Uh, this is one of the authentic book, which is the uh, uh, PhD thesis on the Hazaras from U U uh, USA. So it's quite credentials, it's authentic. And the second one is the uh, Hazaras of Afghanistan, which is also another guy by the name of Saeed Askar Musavi. He wrote it from England, from Oxford University, England, the Hazaras of Afghanistan. And the third one is also from a guy named Otadul Rajam. They call the Hazaras of Balochistan. Hmm. Balochistan is one of the one of the province in Afghanistan, in Pakistan. And he was a master of, he had done his PhD on uh, sociology and he has written all about Hazaras of Pakistan. So the book name is Hazaras of Balochistan. And one of the recent book, which is the Hazaras along the Silk Road, which I think maybe your viewers find it very interesting mm -hmm. because you guys are very close to Silk Road. Mm -hmm. And I know Ganges Khan used the Silk Road, uh, Kublai Khan uh, 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 in the series of Marco Polo used the Silk Road. And also all the other great Khan and Khanate who drives from Mongolia and conquer any part of the world, they use the Silk Road. So this book, The Hazaras, Economically, Politically, and Socially Along the Silk Road, which is a friend of mine who is currently in Canada, published the book. He has done a master, uh, MPhil, Master of Philosophy in Politics. And he has written, it's quite authentic, and it's, um, we are selling it here in Australia, as well as in Pakistan and also around the world. Mm -hmm. So this, your viewers might find it very interesting because this is something related to Mongolia and the Silk Road and China and so on. And there is one of the recent book which is published in Australia, in England, which is called The Hazaras and Afghanistan State. 
This is also one of the Hazara scholars who currently is a lecturer here in Melbourne University. He has written the Hazaras and Afghan State. It is also a research-based book, and it's also quite a good account of Hazaras and also the persecution of by Afghan State. There's another one in, in Europe uh, by the name of uh, Alexander Mansuti. His book name is War and Migration. Hmm. So this guy went 10 years, lived in Afghanistan and wrote this book. He's one of the researchers. He has like 20, 30 articles and several books on the history of Afghanistan. And some of your viewers might be interested, oh, he says, oh, this history is too, too dry, you know, <laughs> very, very boring, you know, give me something funny, you know, something, something interesting, you know. Mm -hmm. So there is a novel written, which is written in 1900. It known the daughter of Wazir. Mm. So there was a British uh, doctor, Lilias Hamilton, who was relative of Queen Victoria. He went in Afghanistan and lived in the, in the palace of a uh, brutal king, which I know by name of Abdurrahman. And he has written the account and recollection of this when he was apprehending one of the Hazara Khan's daughter and brought it to royal palace and what happened to him, to her, you know. So he's followed that account. It's quite fascinating, this book. I highly recommend it. It's also written as novel type, so people won't feel boring. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the title is The Daughter of Wazir. Okay, you also may ask, you know, that if the, our Mongolian brother and sisters, they would like to know more about Hazaras, where they can find on the net, you know. The Hazara net has been, for the past 20 years, been, you know, a credential source authentic source and it's very well documented and very well written, you know, in English language. Uh, the Hazaras, I highly recommend, Hazara.net, which is renowned for its uh, information and the books and all the sources that's there. And they have documented Hazara persecution, Hazara genocide, you know, about Hazara culture, Hazara language, uh, everything Hazara. There's another, uh, also another website to mention, Hazara World dot com this I think a good place to see as well um, so yeah if for the younger generations if they want to know about Hazara for example stories mm -hmm. folklore mm -hmm. they could go on the YouTube and see uh, Buzi Chini which means the Chinese the Chinese goat <laughs> this story has been animated in Hazaragi language as well as with subtitle of English language mm -hmm. which was quite fascinating mm -hmm. it's written by one of the scholars he was he was also assassinated in 2010 because he was Hazara and he was intellectuals and he was raising awareness about Hazaras and also defending Hazara rights in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. So he was being um, targeted by unknown groups mm -hmm. and he was killed. So he's written this story and it's been animated by another guy. So it's quite fascinating and I highly recommend that it gives a good account of uh, for younger generations and for the kids. There's also an uh, English movie made, The Boy Who Play on Buddha's Abhamyan. Mm. It's also a good, good book, uh, no, good, good doc, uh, sort of documentary type movie, The Boy Who Play on Buddha's Abhamyan. It's written, available on, on YouTube and also on website. And there's another movie that has been made by Western, uh, Western cinematographers, they call it Kandahar. Mm. There's also a mention of Hazaras in there as well. So, yeah, this was the suggestion for me that if Mongolian brothers and sisters wanted to know more about Hazaras. And, and just, to, just to mention that, that, you know, we are quite uh, you know, curious and fascinated and we are hoping and we are also, you know, in, 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 in position and situation of collaborating with our Mongolian brothers and sisters. So we wanted to share because uh, we share common ancestry and we share the culture, we share the language we share the knowledge that we had once we share the gene of being a leader and also leading the rest of the world um, also uh, to be patriotic to be also you know to be brave to show some leadership to show uh, marksmanship all those same qualities are available so it would be interesting for mongolian brothers to explore more and in fact you know the language the the song that you guys uh, sing with the throat. We have similar song we call Daidu, which is Hazaragi, they put the hands here, 
is it? Bulbuli gasuba dadu da dhamma hai. It's wow. quite similar to that, yeah. Either one hand or both hands sometimes. Mm. And then they talk like this and moving, you know. It's mm. quite similar to, to uh, the short music that you guys produce. Mm. To, for Mongolians watching this program throughout the world, what message would, like, would you like to convey through this video? What message would you like to give to Mongolians all around the world? Sure. Well, I'm quite humble, you know, uh, to be given an opportunity to speak with Mongolian brothers and sisters. I, I feel very privileged and I am very proud, you know, to be sitting here and talking to yourself and also to thousands of other people who is watching me. Um, it's, it's really an honor to speak because I was always fascinated to discover my root, where I came from. And when I was very young, my father was abducted and he disappeared and I never see him again since 2000. So I grew up not knowing that what my father would, would have a message for me. And I had a lot of thousands of un unanswered questions, you know, who are Hazaras, you know, where they came from, you know, why we've been persecuted, uh, who are my ancestors, uh, who I share the normal blood with, you know who are very next of kin, who is good to me, who has been kind to me in the past. And there's uh, countless other questions that I wanted to ask. But unfortunately, I was not at that privilege because he's been, he's been murdered uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and um, my, many of my dreams and visions. And also, when I was very young, in ch childhood, I had a dream to go to capital of Hazaristan and visit the Buddhas, the giant Buddhas. And, and when I see, seek protection here in Australia, and I, one day I discovered that, you know, is the Buddhas was murdered as well. It's been exploded by bombs. And I no longer can fulfill my vision, my, uh, my, my dream, you know, to go and see the Buddhas. This, my, these two major things in life has been vanished and it's been disappeared. And I feel very sad and feel the pain, you know, because my cultural heritage has been vanished. Some people may think, oh, because there is Muslims, that's why they, they have destroyed the Buddhas, but I don't think so. They, in effect, they wanted to remove the remnant of uh, Mongolian civilization. They wanted to remove anything that connecting Afghanistan with Mongolia. They want to remove the um, advancement of Hazara civilization. They want to remove that the Hazaras, because in the book of Human to Song in 5th century AD, they says that the Hazaras lived here. They want to remove that. They have removed the name of Hazaras from many, many stones, many carvings. And that's why they remove it. It's racial thing. It's not religion thing. That people say, oh, because they are Muslims, that's why they are removing the Buddhists. No, that's not the answer. Because Hazaras has been protecting this for, you know, 16 centuries. And in the end, the Taliban comes, barbarics, and they destroys it. Uh, so the message is that uh, once Mongolian was glorious, as I said in the beginning of my interview, that they conquered half of the world. Uh, sort of being 10 people share the gene of Mongolia. Uh, Mongolia, uh, uh, Genghis Khan, the great Khan, has left uh, the commandments known as Yasa. Um, uh, so he left a lot of uh, heritage, like for example, during Kublai Khan, which he conquered. China and also, you know, um, and uh, the legacies that they, they left behind. Uh, you, you people are the same people. Uh, you share the same gene. Uh, you share the same knowledge. You share the same cultural heritage, same blood. So what it takes for Mongolia to stand shoulder by shoulder with other nations in Asia, uh, what it takes for Mongolia to be, you know, um, not powerful, but you know, to be firm and strongly standing, you know, uh, and doing economically well, doing culturally well, and be one of the true examples in Asian countries. And also, uh, maybe I think uh, as uh, strength in unity, uh, if there is one stick, everybody can break it off very easily. And if there is ten sticks, nobody can break it off, you know. So uh, unity, I think, to be uh, sort of put your differences aside and come together as one people and, you know, 
to gain strength and momentum, you know, and be southern. Southern nation uh, requires some sacrifices. For example, that if you have different difference of political opinion, you can leave it aside, you know. Either some of you, some of people in Mongolia, they may say, oh, Russia is good. Some of people may say, oh, China is good. Some of the people, because they have studied, the new generation studied in America, and the effects of globalization, they will say, oh, America is good. I say, whoever is good, you know, they have political interest. Because I always think in terms of your, your national interest first, you know. After that, you can think, oh, yeah, China is also good, Russia is also good, U.S. is also good, you know. Um, so yeah, strength and powers, so know your roots, you know, where you come from, who your ancestors were, uh, what you are good at, you know, what you can achieve, what your ancestors have achieved, you know. And also, my desires are for Hazaras to have, um, to not be persecuted again. And this is the only ask that I ask from each Mongolian brother and sisters that Hazaras, even if they have been victim of because of their race, because of because of their ethnicity, you know, I don't want to see another persecution and another genocide of Hazaras happen again. That's my only wish. I don't want to wish anything else. And because if the Hazaras have not been genocide, Hazaras not been murdered, uh, Hazaras are talented people. They are. Uh, peaceful, peace-loving people. They are kind people. They wanted to live in brotherhood with the other nations, but the other nations doesn't leave Hazaras to live in peace and harmony. And Hazaras are always seeking new way of thinking, new way of doing things. And Hazaras love uh, education. They are quite liberal when it comes to gender equality because Hazaras, and in the history and in modern day, Hazaras always encourage their female, their women to work shoulder by shoulder, to study shoulder by shoulder, and to advance the countries where they live in, for example, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, or Western countries. They always work for betterment of their country where they live in. So thanks so much. I'm very honored and pleasured and, and, and humbled to be here. Not that person to share the opinion, but I being humble that my opinion has been heard has been watched and has been viewed. I am grateful and thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much also. And uh, I hope that uh, many people in Mongolia watch this uh, video and uh, share the same thoughts with us. And uh, sure. I think it's our duty and responsibility to protect and promote our culture, our ancestral message. I totally agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I totally agree mm -hmm. with you. Uh, the only thing I could say, you know, that uh, dialogues, when two minds meet together, mm. two heads is better than one. When two minds meet together and they share a dialogue, it is one of the strongest things in the world. And um, maybe I think if the Hazaras in Mongolia could start having a dialogue with each other, then, then we can find out our commonalities, what we have in common and how we can put those commonalities together. It's only for having a dialogue. Yep. Mm -hmm. This is the this is the great start. Mm -hmm. And the great start leads to great result. Mm -hmm. I believe so. Mm -hmm.